I'm going to see, first of all, can, okay, I just want to make sure. Can you hear me? No. Okay. I'm going to, then that's better, right? Yes. Okay. So first of all, I like to say that I'm from Pennsylvania. I just lived in California for a few years, <laughs> which is true. Um, and uh, second of all, thank you very much for having me. It was a delight to be part of your 25th anniversary celebration on Tuesday, and it was impressive and a great learning opportunity for me to hear about your history and witness the enthusiasm of this group for all that you do. Um, I decided to work in, at a college because I think this is the most vibrant place on earth and um, the four years or more that people get to spend when they're privilege privileged enough to do so in college are extraordinary and I think the only thing that beats it is retirement. <laughs> so I think I, I congratulate all of you for doing retirement very, very well. I cannot wait to join you. Um, but I do love what I do, so I'm excited to be here and talk with you today. I understand the format is to go for about an hour, have a break, and then continue talking. Um, and I'm going to try to also make have pauses where people can ask questions. But if, if you're dying to ask a question, raise your hand and let me know, and I can at least write it down, and we can get to it later if, if we don't um, get to it right away. So I'm here to talk about emerging adulthood, which is a developmental stage proposed by Jeffrey Arnett, a developmental psychologist at Clark University in Worcester, Mass, and how it impacts the work that I do, specifically in the way that we think about our relationships with students and alumni and parents. And because this is a talk about developmental stages and how we become who we are, I thought that I should start by telling you a little bit about myself. So I was born on the day the men walked on the moon, um, 1969, which it, it, you know you, now you know I'm 48 years old. Um, my father was not in the delivery room because at the time, fathers were not in the delivery room. Apparently, he called my mother later that day told her what a miracle it was that the men were landing on the moon, and she had some very choice words for him about what miracles really entailed. <laughs> um, my godmother wanted to name me Luna, and so I'm very grateful to my parents for not gifting me with that name. But, you know, I was a child that came of age when, um, when this was happening. Um, I was the child of two first-generation college students who went to Penn State. They were in the blue band together, although um, this dates them. They were in the uh, college in the 50s, and at the time, women did not march. They only played in the concert band. And my father graciously carried my mother's instrument cases all four years before she graduated, and it was only years later that they started to date. But um, so the idea of going to college was never a question for me. It was a tremendous privilege that my parents both got to go, and my father got into MIT, and my mother got into um, Bryn Mawr, and neither of them could afford to go. So the idea that I would go someplace elite and extraordinary was also firmly in my mind from an early age. I grew up in the Susquehanna Valley in Pennsylvania. I like to say that it's very similar to the Willamette Valley, but you guys have wine and Christmas trees instead of corn and tobacco, so I think you're doing it better. <laughs> you also do not have mosquitoes or lots of snow, but you are missing lightning bugs. So I don't know which is better, but um, it was a beautiful place to grow up. I did wind up having the opportunity to go to an elite institution, Mount Holyoke College, which is a small private women's college in Massachusetts, one of the original Seven Sisters. And I got to be there for three years until my father lost his job amidst a company that had all kinds of legal problems, and suddenly my 1986, $22,000 a year of college tuition became an extreme burden on my family. So, oh, that's Mount Holyoke in the snow, just to remind you why I now live in Oregon <laughs> instead of the East. So I transferred to Penn State. This is an aerial view of the Penn State campus, just to give you a sense of how different it is from Willamette and from Mount Holyoke and from Bucknell and Occidental, the places I've spent most of my career. Um, it was a wonderful educational experience in all kinds of ways. I would have been eaten alive if I had gone there as a first-year student. Way too much distraction, way too many things to do, no honors college at the time, so I was in a classroom with students of all kinds of abilities and levels. But I learned a lot about the world and class and race 
and um, I'm grateful for the time that I spent there, and I believe very strongly in the role of large public institutions in educating the people in our country, but I feel very grateful that I now get to work at a place more like where my heart was, which was Mount Holyoke. So after college, I was a social worker. I worked in a literacy organization, um, ran a one county office tutoring adults to learn to read and get their GED, and I was also a crisis intervention counselor. I use these skills, the crisis intervention ones, all the time as a manager, <laughs> believe it or not. <laughs> so I'm very grateful for that background. But at some point, I was getting burnt out and I decided I really wanted a different career and what did I want to do and I didn't know but I knew I wanted to work at a college because colleges are cool. And so I took a job at Bucknell doing whatever I could find and that job happened to be in the development office and that was 20 years ago. So I found my calling accidentally um, and I spent 15 years at Bucknell in a variety of positions where I eventually was leading the comprehensive fundraising campaign that they just completed at $500 million. And I learned a ton, both from working there, but also I uh, gradually got my master's in higher education while I was a student there. So the, um, the talk that I'm giving is about a theory that I studied in graduate school and, um, and conversations I've had with professional colleagues about that theory since that time and how it's influenced my work. Um, after 15 years at Bucknell, I decided that if I never left Pennsylvania, I would wind up spending my whole life there and that would be okay, but I sort of wanted an adventure. And I thought about moving to London because I could see Europe and then Occidental called me and recruited me and I said, well, Los Angeles is kind of like moving to another country. <laughs> From a town of 8,000 people in the Susquehanna Valley to a city of many, many millions. And I spent four years there and it was extraordinary and wonderful, but it didn't feel like home. And Steve kept calling me and kept calling me and kept calling me and finally I said, fine, I'll come and talk to you. And then I stepped foot on Willamette's campus and got to know some of the folks here and I really fell in love. So here I am. That's not a very clear picture, but this is my favorite view. Um, if you stand, if you recognize this tree, um, the magnolia in the spring that blooms, if you stand underneath it and look through it, it's my favorite place on campus. Okay. So before I go on, I want to know just a little bit about you. I'm going to ask questions and ask you to raise your hand because we're going to talk about generations and behaviors. So um, many of you have probably heard the term the greatest generation, people born before 1928. Do we have any of you here? Awesome. Well done, you. Congratulations. Um, I never liked this phrase, but the silent generation, I suspect y'all aren't very silent at all, but 1928 to 1945, and this would have been my parents' generation. Okay, excellent. And then the baby boomers, 46 to 64. You're gonna take over soon, I know. We're all watching you. You silent generation people, watch out, the baby boomers are nipping at your heels. Um, okay, for those of you who well, who went from high school right to work? Right to work. Who went from high school right to work? Okay. So most of you went from high school right to college. Is that correct? Okay. Who went to college and graduated in four-ish years? Okay. So other than women who may have moved home to live with their parents before marriage, because that's what people did at a certain time. I know that's what my mother did. Who ever lived with their parents after college? Okay. How many of you have had more than two careers in your life? Oh, how many of you had had more than four? How many of you have had more than six? Okay, very adaptable, excellent. And how many of you lived with a romantic partner before marriage, who didn't eventually become your husband or wife? <laughs> if you'll admit it publicly. <sighs> so, if we were sitting in the room with a group of 18 to 28 year olds, which is what we are describing as emerging adulthood, the answers to these questions would be vastly, vastly different. So, <laughs> what does this have to do with my work? Well, one could argue that 30 years ago, colleges and universities didn't care much about their young alumni. And their alumni offices, as a result, didn't really care much about their students. Advancement offices were small, 
and alumni offices even smaller. With the exception of an annual solicitation, colleges and universities focus their limited resources on relationships that would bear fundraising fruit more quickly, programming for older alumni who are more likely to be in a position to make significant gifts to their alma mater. The culture of, cultural revolution of the 1960s marked a period of significant changes in many things about college, things that had been constant for many, many generations. How many of you were in college during the cultural revolution of the 60s? Yes, well, thank you. I, I really appreciate it. <laughs> um, these changes included who attended college, the nature of the student experience, and how students and therefore alumni re related to the institution itself. As financial and societal barriers to admission broke down, college students were more diverse by gender, socioeconomic class, ethnicity, age, and religion. As students rejected what felt like outdated rules and traditions, the curricular and co-curricular experiences of individual students on the same campus became far more varied. As young people rejected authority of their parents, specifically, and their elders in general, the relationship between students and the institution shifted from one of in loco parentis to a more adversarial relationship. The trends have continued since that time, so much so that college, the college-going population is demographically dominated by what we continue to refer as non-traditional students. So Willamette is an exception to that. 2% of the college-going population goes to schools like Willamette. When we hear and we read in the news about what college is, it is not describing Willamette University. 98% of students in college are not at institutions like Willamette. And by that I mean a small residential private college. Alumni relations programming has been slow to respond to these changes. For several decades, alumni programming continued to target middle-aged and older white males, and also to build upon an outdated sense of what the college experience was for the majority of students. Reunions and regional events dominated our programming based on the expectation that the loyalty to class and alma mater remained strong. So how many of you, when you went to college, wore a beanie and a sign with your name and your hometown on it? Or you were stopped by an upperclassman and made to sing the alma mater, right? What other kinds of um, hazing, and that was a, it was a friendly term when, we, when you were in school, what kind of hazing rituals did you experience? in college. So usually, I find almost at every college there were traditions that, oh, yes? You had to stand up in the entire cafeteria and sing the alma mater that you had to write? Oh my goodness, okay. Oh my gosh. Oh boy. We could unpack that for the next two hours if we wanted to. Yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. Yes. Well, so the engineering smoker at University of Colorado. So the smoker concept, right? This is a non-smoking campus that's gone away. So many, many colleges and universities had traditions that everyone participated in. And some of them were a little bit like hazing, like some of the things you described. And some of them were really meaningful to build class identity. I don't know how many of you have heard of freshman glee um, at Willamette, but there was a tradition for many, many years where the classes wrote songs and performed them and competed against each other. And, and this went on until the two, early 2000s. And um, it died a slow death because the students really weren't that into it. But, but for many, many years, this was a tradition. Records were printed. And the most important part of this tradition was apparently based on the bets you made with people from other classes and how you had to pay the, debt, the bet if you didn't win, I see some, you must be an alumna, so you're, you're nodding with recognition. It involved, and this, I think the competition was in February, and it involved getting in your swim trunks in the mill stream cold and all kinds of other embarrassing things. But if you talk to alumni who graduated really before 1990, all the way back, every single one of them participated in Glee. 
every single one. And any college that you go to for that era, especially the 40s, 50s, and 60s, there were these traditions that created class identity and identity with institution. And they were very, very strong. The 60s broke a lot of that down. Lots of the traditions felt patriarchal. They felt uh, just anti-youth at that point, and so students no longer wanted to participate. We built alumni programming around a lot of those traditions, and so when the tradition started to break down, the alumni then no longer identified with class and with alma mater in the same way, and we've been slow to respond to that. So it became clear that the decline in alumni donations by number and dollars was a trend. It wasn't going away, and colleges and universities became concerned. So the reason we started caring was because the dollars were going down. I'm just gonna be honest. Um, alumni in midlife were no longer making philanthropic support of their alma mater a priority. And the big question was why? This question has launched several decades of analysis which continues still, but one major theme has emerged. We can no longer expect our alumni to come back to us in midlife. If we want our alumni to support our institution in all kinds of ways, we have to engage with them from the moment they graduate. In fact, it's now widely understood that even that is not enough and that we must engage with our alumni from the moment they become our students. This new perspective has been influencing programming and resources put towards this programming in alumni ever since. So it's really a frame from which we have to ask, what are we supposed to do to maximize the relationship between our alumni and our institution? And in order to answer that question, we have to know who they are, who are our students and alumni. So social scientists have studied extensively the differences that have emerged over time in the characteristics and outlooks of success successive generations of Americans. Strass and Howe have defined generation as a cohort whose length approximates the span of a phase of life, whose boundaries are fixed by peer personality, meaning you have similar experiences because you lived through a similar era. There are four commonly recognized phases of life, youth, rising adulthood, midlife, and I love this, elderhood. <laughs> each, which, each of which covers approximately 22 years. The peer personality of a generation is a profile of its typical member based on the attributes that are most representative of that generation as a whole. The peer personality reflects the unique perspective that is shared by the members of that generation as a product of their having experienced a common cultural history informed by a relatively uniform level of maturity at each step of the way. So, we know that generations have changed and we know when we look at pictures of college students over different eras. So, the picture on the left is from the 1950s. Dapper, yes? Um, the picture on the right, of course, is from the 1970s. No surprises there. The picture on the left here is from the 1980s. And it was interesting to me, actually, how similar the photographs of the 80s were to the 50s. I even dug out my mom's cashmere cardigan sweaters from her cedar chest that she wore when she was a Penn State student and wore them when I was in college. Everything preppy was in again. You know, these cyclical things, it was kind of interesting. And of course, this is a picture of college students now. So we know intuitively that college students are different and therefore alumni and generations are different. Social scientists have studied extensively the difference that have emerged over time. And, um, and of course, now we have terms that help us to understand who these generations are. The greatest generation, the silent generation, Generation X, or baby boomers, I'm sorry. Generation X, that's me, Generation Y, or the millennials, who are the students in college now, although our first and second year students are no longer, according to people who know these things and determine these things, part of the millennial generation, and I think that new generation is yet to be named. Some are calling it Generation Z, but we'll see. Um, but most 18 to 28 year olds are part of the millennial generation. So this includes students born since 1982. And it would appear that this generation is destined 
to become the first civic cohort since the GI generation. So a generation that cares by social scientist standards more about other people than themselves. All of us baby boomers and generation Xers, we've been a little self-absorbed, apparently. The next generation, I'm sorry. Hmm. Millennials are carefully protected by their parents, raised to believe that they were precious and loved, and as a consequence of their upbringing, members of this generation have typically grown up to be optimistic and self-assured. Trends in education have also led them to believe, become more collaborative, driven to excel than previous generations have been, and that reflects an internalization of the pressure to succeed that has been imposed upon them for much of their lives. Millennials have also been described as trusting and supportive of the social institutions that exist and the values of their elders. There's tons and tons of literature on millennials. You can find, this is a little infographic that describes who they are. There's, there's just thousands and thousands of websites on what, millenni what millennials are, what they believe, but let's just think a little bit about how, um, how that description plays out um, on a college campus today. So, first of all, they trust their elders. So remember how we talked about in loco parentis going away in the 60s? Well, it's back, big time. They trust their parents. They talk to their parents, often, multiple times a day. They include their parents in decisions about what's happening at college, what's happening in their life. Um, they're motivated more by what they're doing than how much they're making. They are multitasking constantly. They don't even like email. They text and they Snapchat and they Instagram. But if you have grandchildren that you email, you probably don't get emails back from them, yes? Email is something that only, only um, institutions use to communicate with them, not people that they know and care about. They're leaders and entrepreneurs. They're more interested in starting their own business than becoming part of a bigger business. And they think they have it all figured out, which I think is a common theme for people in that 18 to 28 age range across generations. But this is a particularly entrepreneurial generation. And of course, social media, games, music, news, all of it is online. They don't use books or newspapers. Um, they interact entirely, almost, with a virtual world. And I say, there's no judgment in that statement. This is just how they interact with the world, right? It's just vastly, vastly different. So as people who work in colleges and work with students and work with alumni, we want to understand our generations, right? We want to we know who they are. And one of the very uh, popular things that goes around at the beginning of ac every academic year is the Beloit mindset list. So in addition to knowing these things about millennials, we also need to understand what this particular class is like, what's, who's on our campus right now. And Beloit College in Beloit, Wisconsin has for decades been developing a list of facts about this generation to help those of us who are significantly older understand what their mindset is, right? So I'm just gonna share a few things with you from this year's Beloit Mindset List. <laughs> so they do not know what it's like to all sit down and watch the same episode of Ed Sullivan, right? Everyone was watching The Beatles on Ed Sullivan. For me, it was Johnny Carson. Everyone watched Friends. Everyone, all my friends, we'd have parties, we'd get together on the same night and you'd talk about it the next day. This doesn't happen. There's no, uh, there's not three networks, there's what, hundreds? There's no common media experience. What they're watching, when they're watching. This one. <laughs> they don't remember anybody before a Bush or a Clinton. I mean, they remember Obama, of course, but there have been Bushes and Clintons campaigning for things their entire life. Smoking has always been bad and unhealthy. I know this, this is an interesting billboard on many levels, <laughs> right? <laughs> and science has been what, what we consider magic, what I consider magic, and, and the future, is actually real, right? Computers in the palm of our hand, 
That Apollo 11 space shuttle looks like it was made out of aluminum foil. I cannot believe that they put that thing on the moon, which is, of course, why the conspiracy theories start. But um, cloning has always been routine. The United States has always been at war. The US population is changing demographically faster um, and more dramatically than ever before. They completely disagree about Star Wars, and we all know they're wrong. <laughs> they think episode one is actually the first episode, and then they don't understand why the, the effects, the special effects, get so much worse with episodes four, five, and six. Am I right? Yes. They were two on 9-11. These things that created our cultural identity, our social identity, these major events that we all went through, Nixon resigning, Roe v. Wade, Kennedy being assassinated, you can remember exactly where you were. I'm sure every single person here who was alive and you know old enough can remember exactly where they were when Kennedy was shot. I remember when the space shuttle Challenger exploded because I was watching it in school on television. I remember Columbine. I know exactly where I was. These things are just history. So it's really important for those of us who work in colleges to go through this exercise to remember that the people we're teaching and nurturing and helping to grow and evolve they might look kind of like we did, or even like students from 10 or 15 years ago, but they are not. They come from a completely different perspective. Does this ring true when you think about your, especially your grandchildren, I would imagine, maybe some of you, your children, but yeah? So, if we now understand who our students are, we have to start thinking about who our alumni are as well. This generational approach to alumni engagement still pretty much leads to generational programming, though. Um, this programming is largely based on nostalgia. It's think fondly of your days at alma mater. Remember the leaves falling on the quad. Let me send you this picture of the beautiful tower on campus. Let's get together and talk about the old days and the traditions. And those bonds and connections are important. I'm not making light of them. They're very powerful. I'm grateful for them. They serve me very well when I do my job. But as generations became less and less connected to alma mater, and as traditions became less and less common, in my world, we continued to do the same programming. And so we were losing ties to, uh, to students who became alumni who didn't actually connect with these traditions and these ways of being when they were in college. And honestly, this is still true in many alumni programs around the country. We have lots of big reunions because people used to go to college near where they lived, and we anticipate that it's easy for people to get back to their alma mater. And we focus a lot of money and energy and staff time on bringing the class together when what might be more important to you is that you sang in a choir or that you were in the lab all the time with your chemistry classmates and professors or that you started an activist group around uh, protesting the war in Vietnam or that you developed your identity as a person of color, or a woman, or an LGBTQ individual, or a Latina, Latino, whatever it was. So these programs are important, but they miss the mark for a lot of students. We have grown up a little bit. Oh, I'm missing a page. Let's see here. Yes, we have grown up a little bit in our programming, and we have realized that we need to um, connect with students while they're here so we understand who they are and we need to record data on them. What did they do while they were here so that we can engage them in activities that relate to their interests and that students are actually more interested in connecting with other alumni than the institution itself. So an intergenerational networking is more interesting to young people today. So we, we have learned that and we have learned that 
it was easy to do social hours, happy hours for young alums who were not yet settled down, and then retirement programming for older alumni, travel programs, come back to campus, et cetera, but we were missing the middle years when people were busy with kids and career, kids, family, and career, and so some colleges and universities did start to do career networking for alumni, but mostly it was alumna to alumnus, right? It was you work in medicine, you work in tech, you work in education, et cetera, you work in law, et cetera, et cetera. But we did, we did grow up, I would say, in the, in the 2000s into programs that got beyond just simply when did you go to college. But it really hadn't, it didn't create the changes we needed in the level of engagement our alums had with the institution and the way that they, of course, supported the institution. So we had to start asking a different question. Oh, I'm sorry. And these, pro these, these programs were all designed on relationships. So we graduated from simple nostalgia to understanding that it was the relationships, the connective tissue that people build while they're on campus with their faculty, with their friends that were important. Um, so we, we did improve, but not enough. So we had to start thinking about it differently. And we started, or at least some of us, are starting to ask this question about who are our students becoming? Programs designed for older adult alumni did not translate well to younger alums. And the instincts of advancement professionals about how to engage with younger alumni have failed to reverse the trends in engagement and donation levels. So this is where Jeffrey Arnett's theory of emerging adulthood comes in. If we want to know how to better connect to our emerging adults, we need to understand them and develop programming that meets them where they are, not where we expect them to be. In spite of all the ways that the college-going population has changed from age at entry, age at graduation, number of institutions attended, time to completion, and more, advancement programming for alumni relations has only begun to acknowledge this truth about our audience. The most fundamental part of Arnett's work, simply the age range for this developmental stage, might be the most illuminating for the field of advancement. Emerging adults begin at 18 and they end at 29. So the transition to adulthood is not when you graduate from college. The college experience does not begin at 18 and end with graduation four years later. Instead, Arnett helps us to understand that commencement is usually not a bridge to a student's future with a capital F, but one step in a process, one moment during a developmental stage that is full of uncertainty and change. Using Arnett's work as a lens through which to understand our audience and design programming presents challenges for my field and also really great opportunities. So that's what I'm gonna talk about now. So before we go into our next theory, I want to start with Erickson. Um, er Erickson was an a, a adult development theorist. In the 50s, he proposed a psychoanalytic theory of psychosocial development, comprising eight stages from infancy to adulthood. And most of our contemporary understanding of how people mature comes from this model. Erickson's ideas were greatly influenced by Freud, going along with his theory regarding the structure and topography of personality. However, where Freud was an id psychologist, Erickson was an ego psychologist. He emphasized the role of culture and society and the conflicts that can take place within the ego itself. According to Erickson, the ego develops as it successfully resolves a crisis at each stage, and that crisis is distinctly social in nature. The crises involved establishing a sense of trust, developing a sense of identity in society, and helping the next generation prepare for the future. His theory of psychosocial development has eight stages taking in five stages up to the age of 18 years and three further beyond. So most of your uh, progress through this chart happens in your first 18 years of age. And then he sort of thought of adulthood as, as, as much broader and longer developmental stages. He suggests that there is still plenty of room for continued growth and development throughout one's life, but puts a great deal of emphasis on adolescence. He assumes that a crisis occurs in each stage, and according to the theory, successful completion of each stage results in a healthy personality and the acquisition of basic characteristics. Fair failure to successfully complete a stage can result in a uh, reduced ability to complete further stages. So 
you can see adolescence is 12 to 18, and then he has young adult as 18 to 40. Now, what 18-year-old is like a 40-year-old? Right, so in, adult, in understanding adult development, we have been, for the past 50 years, 60 years, thinking about who people are between 18 and 40. And so what Arnett is doing is suggesting that there's a much more specific stage that happens at the beginning of this period that we would not call adulthood. We would call it emerging adulthood. So that is his thesis, and it's becoming more and more widely supported. So this is important for those of us who work in college because it's our job to help people successfully navigate at least the beginning of this stage, right? There's cognitive development, which is what our faculty do, and there's psychosocial development, which is what campus life and student life professionals do, right? We educate the whole person. We want to help people grow and develop and become fully-fledged humans, good citizens of the world, and there's two important developmental theories that we use when guiding this work. One is San Sanford's theory of challenge and support. It's really, really simple. It's kind of one of those duh things that you learn in graduate school. The notion is that people grow the most when they have the right balance of challenge and support. You challenge them too much, their growth and development slows. You support them too much, and their growth and development slows. So the ideal campus life programming provides opportunities for students to engage in things that are challenging, that push them, but have enough support underneath that they're not going to completely crash. And of course, the frustrating thing is that every single student on your campus needs a different degree of challenge and support. But this is a theory that we use when we think about students in, in campus life, and we try to create opportunities um, that maximize this perfect, if you think of it as a seesaw, with challenge on one side and support on the other, it's not unlike parenting, right? Um, this perfect balance between challenge and support. So that's something we think about it, but we think about it for four years while they're in college. That's how we've thought about it, for while they're in school. When they enter, everything about how we design orientation programs for new students comes from this idea. Everything about how we increase their level of responsibility and independence comes from this idea. Another big idea, a theory, is rests plus one theory. And this is also pretty straightforward, and the idea is that if you're studying any kind of developmental process, whether it's cognitive or psychosocial or identity development along the lines of gender or race or ethnicity or um, sexual identity, any of these things, you can only understand the stage you're at and one stage ahead. So their prefrontal cortexes are not done until they're 26 or 27 years old, which also kind of fits with the emerging adulthood time frame, right? Their brains literally aren't done. So one of the big things about Arnett's work that's made me think about is why do we think that people are grown up when they graduate from college? Um, it, and it's a really important question. And, and, and young adults' behavior is suggesting to us, actually, that they're not, and they know it. So these are just um, some theoretical frameworks that we think about all the time. And, um, and now I want to explain a little bit more about what Arnett's theory really is. He argues that emerging adulthood is neither adolescence nor young adulthood, but is theoretically and empirically different from both. He is a social scientist who has collected a ton of data. One of the reasons that I really like his work is because he didn't interview 12 college students and then call it a theory. He did qualitative and quantitative study on thousands and thousands of young people. And so this theory comes out of a much more solid data foundation than many of the hypotheses that I've seen other people pose about young adults. Emerging adulthood is distinguished by relative independence from social roles and normative expectations. Having left the dependency of childhood and adolescence, and having not yet entered the enduring responsibilities that are normative in adulthood, emerging adults often explore a variety of possible life directions in love, work, and worldviews. It is a time of life when many different directions remain possible. When little about the future has been decided for certain, and when the scope of independent exploration of life's possibilities is greater for most people than it will be at any other period in their lives. Sounds pretty cool. So this group is demographically distinct than other groups. 
meaning during adolescence up to age 18, most demographic areas show little variation. 95% of American adolescents 12 to 17 live at home with one or more parents. So we can say there's a lot of consistency there. 98% are unmarried and fewer than 10% have a child and over 95% are enrolled in school. So we can describe some de demographics about adolescents very well because the group is so consistent. By age 30, the other side of emerging adulthood, norms have been established again. About 75% of 30-year-olds have married, become parents, and fewer than 10% of them are enrolled in school. Not quite the same degree of norms across the age group, but very, very consistent. In between these two periods, however, especially from 18 to 25, but all the way up to 29, a person's demographic, demographic status in these areas is very difficult to predict based on age. The diversity and unpredictability of emerging adulthood is a reflection of that experimental and exploratory quality of the period. So in residential status, one third of emerging adults are in college or some kind of semi-independent living. 40% of them live independently and work full time. Two thirds experience co cohabitation with a romantic partner one, two, three, or four times during this period. Some remain and many return home. The unifying theme is that they move around a lot. 60% of them go to college right after school, but only 35% have finished college by the end of emerging adulthood. So while there's still a majority that go right to college, um, many of them take time off, drop out, go back, and 40% of them who don't go to college right away, some percentage of them pursue college later, which is much more common now than it was when most of us were in school. The nonlinear path to education is not just common, it is the norm. In a variety of studies with young people in their teens and 20s, Demographic transitions, such as finishing education, settling into a career, marriage, and parenthood, rank at the bottom of importance among possible criteria considered for necessary attainment of adulthood. I'm going to read that again. In studies of young people today, in their teens and 20s, finishing education, settling into a career, marriage, and parenthood rank at the bottom of importance in how they would judge whether they have reached adulthood or not. The characteristics that matter most to this group in their subjective sense of whether or not I am an adult, their individualistic qualities of character, the two top criteria for the transition to adulthood have been accepting responsibilities for oneself and making independent decisions. So that kind of blows my mind, and it also explains a lot, right? People who are making these, what I consider to be these massive life decisions that signal adulthood, and yet still rely on their parents financially and for help and assistance in decision making. It's, it's just a massive change to me. And a third criterion, which is individualistic, but a little more tangible, is becoming financially independent, also consistently ranks near the top. So it is adolescence rather than emerging adulthood that has typically been associated with identity formation. We think, we figure out who we are in high school, we try on a bunch of different personalities, and then we go to college and we study to figure out what we want to do with the rest of our lives, right? Well, Erickson des designated identity versus role confusion as the central crisis of the adolescent stage of life. We're seeing that identity versus role confusion be massively delayed, sometimes until after college. So kids are on a path, they know exactly who they are, they know exactly what they want to major in, they come to college, sometimes they get all the way through college before they have that moment of, holy crap, I have just been doing this because that's the path I was on. Maybe because that's what my parents wanted me to do, maybe just because it was in the air that I breathed in the community that I lived in, but I haven't really asked questions about what I want to do or who I want to be. 
So the industrial, industrialization of society has allowed for this prolonged adolescence. So you know, you could call emerging adulthood delayed or continued adolescence, I suppose, if you wanted to. In love, explorations become more intimate and serious in adolescence. Um, they tend to be tentative and transient. In emerging adulthood, I'm sorry, in adolescence, the question is, who would I enjoy being with now? In emerging adulthood, the question is, who will I enjoy being with for life? given the kind of person I am and the things that I want to do. In work, in emerging adulthood, work experiences become more focused on preparation for adult roles, and emerging adults begin to consider how their work experiences will lay the groundwork for jobs they might have throughout adulthood. In exploring various possibilities, they explore identity issues as well. What kind of work am I good at? What kind of work would I find satisfying for the long term? What are my chances of getting a job in the field that seems to suit me best? The absence of enduring role commitments in emerging adulthood makes possible a degree of experimentation and exploration that is not likely to be possible later in their lives. And for people who wish to have a variety of romantic and sexual experiences, emerging adulthood is the time for it because parental surveillance has diminished and there is yet little normative pressure to enter marriage. For this reason, short-term volunteer jobs in programs such as AmeriCorps or the Peace Corps are far more common today than ever. Emerging adults may also travel to different parts of the country or the world on their own for limited or extended periods of time, often in the context of limited term work or educational experience. This too can be part of their identity exploration, part of expanding their range of personal experiences prior to making the more enduring choices of adult adulthood. So if we are thinking about alumni, students and alumni, for the first 10 years after graduation, we have to keep these things in mind. They're not going to one address and doing one job and getting married and settling down. They're having a decade, a decade of really vastly different experiences than what most of us remember. So most research onto changes in worldviews during emerging adulthood has involved college students and graduate students and there is evidence that higher education promotes explorations and reconsiderations of worldviews. But it's notable that emerging adults who do not attend college are as likely as college students to indicate that deciding on their own beliefs and values is an essential criterion for attaining adult status. And this, I think, is important for us to understand just as citizens of the world. I work at a college, I love college, I think it's wonderful, but it's wrong for us to assume that people who don't attend college aren't going through these same explorations and aren't giving themselves permission to have as many vastly different experiences, traveling the world, doing volunteer work, all of these things as others. Research on emerging adults' religious beliefs also suggests that regardless of educational background, they consider it important during this stage to re-examine the beliefs they have learned in their families and to form a set of beliefs that is the product of their own independent reflections. So, you know, you have a granddaughter who is reared in the Methodist church and then becomes a Buddhist and then becomes an atheist and then becomes Jewish for a while. And, you know, this is actually quite common, trying on um, really I wholly accepting and, and trying on different identities to figure out where their personal belief systems um, lie. So all of this can sound really exciting. Who of us wouldn't maybe have preferred in our 20s to have a decade of exploration before we settled down and had work and children to take care of? I got married when I was 23. Um, I went right to work. I, I was the single, um, I was the primary breadwinner for my family always. Um, I was a grown up while this was starting and most of my friends were out doing all that exploration and I'm you know, I don't regret that decision, but sometimes, wow, that would be kind of cool. But it is hard. It is not all fun and games. Exploration and love sometimes results in disappointment, disillusionment, and rejection. Exploration and work sometimes results in a failure to achieve the occupation you most desire, or an inability to find work that is satisfying and fulfilling. Um, and exploration in worldviews sometimes leads to the rejection of your childhood beliefs without the construction of anything tangible or solid in its place. 
So it is a time that is both wildly experimental and exciting, and also can be terrifying. Does that resonate with some of you as you think about the young people in your lives? They seem a lot more stressed out than they should be, considering they get to backpack around Europe. <laughs> no? Um, OK, I'm conscious. OK, I'm going to do one more slide, and then we'll take a break. Emerging adulthood is not a universal period, but a period that exists only in cultures that postpone the entry into adult roles and responsibilities until well past the late teens. So one of the things that Arnett has done in his work is he's been careful to study people from all ethnicities and socioeconomic classes within the United States. But he has observed differences in other cultures. So immigrant families who are living here, whose culture, whose family culture is still primarily defined from by the culture from which they came or cultures in other countries. So emerging adulthood would be most likely to be found in countries that are highly industrial or post-industrial. Uh, they require a high level of education and training for entry into the information-based information professions that are the most prestigious and lucrative. So many of their young people remain in school into their early 20s and mid-20s. Marriage and parenthood are typically postponed until well after school has ended, which allows for this period of exploration of various relationships before marriage and for exploration of various jobs before taking on the responsibility of supporting oneself or a child financially. So it is worth noting that the, he, Arnett is not claiming this to be a universal, uh, a universal development in psychosocial development for um, for young people and emerging adults. Um, this is still, you know, the research on this is still very much in development, so it'll be interesting to see what he thinks about this in, uh, in 10 or 15 years. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, this is a good natural break point. I think you all want to break, yes? Okay, um, so I'm gonna stop here and, um, or, yeah, I'll stop here and then we'll start with some questions and then I'll get back to it. Does that sound good? 10 minutes. We're going to enter into a, a question and answer period now. There was just lots of material there. I think we're going to have a new, uh, a new uh, demographic cohort called Emerging uh, Approaching Middle Age someday. But, but right now we'll deal with emerging adulthood. Uh, let me remind everybody that uh, the first time you speak, if you would mention your name, uh, that would be nice. And secondly, when you ask a question, uh, try to be as focused on the question as possible because I'm sure there will be lots of questions and comments here as well. So uh, let's go. If you have, uh, put your hands up. If you have cell phones, turn them off. This is Charlene. Hi, Charlene. Hi. Um, is this on? I'm, Hold on. Is this on? Can people hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. On one of your charts up there, it said that the millennials went from sometime to 1997. Well, this is 20 years later than that. So are they still considered millennials? No, no. So it's interesting. Generations don't really get defined. The characteristics of that generation don't get defined until they, they're a little older. So the current emerging adults, 18 to 29 year olds, all but the very youngest of them would still be considered millennials because they were born then. But the youngest emerging adults, the 18 and 19 year olds in that group, they're of some yet to be determined demographic characteristic, generational characteristic, and it will take the social scientists a little while. I mean, I know people are positing theories and there have been some articles about Gen Z, which is maybe the name that'll stick, maybe the name, maybe it'll change, about who these people are, but it takes a little while to really figure out how to describe the generation. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Arthur. Uh, it seems to me that your uh, presentation, the first part of it, uh, seemed to be about uh, efforts to impose uh, a homogeneity onto a very, very complex subject. For example, uh, Willamette University has a large number of foreign students. Mm -hmm. And what do you do about alumni relationships with uh, this cohort of students who will be returning to a yeah. different environment than exists here in the US? Yeah, no, it's a really good question. Um, Arnett's theory is really based on, his research is really based on industrialized countries 
starting in the United States, his research really focused um, on all people from this 18 to 29 year age range, regardless of socioeconomic class, ethnicity, um, gender identification, sexual orientation, and college attendance. So he did include, someone asked me about that at the break, he did include um, people who are not attending college in his research, um, but he has not really written about, that I am aware of, um, about other, not this, particularly, this particular developmental stage in other cultures outside of referencing that he recognizes it's more common in industrialized countries. So we do have to think about international students, um, both how they interact with us on campus and how we consider them and treat them and engage with them as alumni. And I can talk about that. The next stage of my talk will be more about what does this mean for us and how we do our work, and I can talk a little bit more about that then. But, um, you know, we still have, at Willamette, we still have a very, very small percentage of alumni who either are international or live internationally. And so, um, because we have to apply resources broadly, we tend to not do as much programming for our international alums because there are so few of them. You could almost say that's true about our alums in the East Coast as well, because we just don't have as many. But. Um, but you're, you're raising a very important question. A very important question. This is this is just one lens. Yeah. Yes, sir. Oh, ma'am. Hi. Hi. Uh, my name is uh, Sally Shriver. Uh, you're speaking to me about my grandsons, <laughs> who both are in college. Two of them are in college. I hate to say this, but uh, one of the things that really bothered me was during the election, they could care less. Really? Is that? a generation thing? Uh, neither one of them voted. Um, well, I, I haven't studied that. Um, and political activity isn't part of our net's work in particular. Um, I'll just say what I've observed from working in colleges for the last 20 years is that, at least on college campuses, students are far more politically engaged today than they were in the 80s and the 90s. Um, but that is anecdotal. <laughs> <laughs> observational, um, and I have only worked at small private liberal arts colleges, so also a very small slice of the college-going population. So I don't know, but it's a really interesting question. You can imagine, though, some of this identity exploration, this vast variety of, of changes in their lives would include periods where they are not engaged in civic life and periods where they are engaged in civic life, and what that looks like um, can change a lot during that period of time. So um, there was a question over here, and then, oh, sorry. Tell me where I should go. Oh, oh yes, Mark. Hi, my name is Mark. Hi. <laughs> um, could you speak to how music becomes a, 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 a identifier of generational differences? How music becomes uh, an identifier? Yes. Um, again, so I am not a social scientist. I want to make that very clear. <laughs> um, but what I would say is actually one of the things that people talk a lot about with millennials uh, um, is that they, while music, their music is very different from ours, from mine and from yours perhaps, um, that the diversity in the music within the generation is much greater again because they don't have three television channels and two radio stations that are programming their entertainment for them. They have thousands and thousands. So, um, so that I would say there's much, one of the themes in our Nets work is that there's, there's not a lot of consistency in interests and tastes and demographics in this emerging adulthood phase. And I'm sure that part of that is influenced by the freedom that they have from adult responsibilities, but part of it is probably also influenced by the world we live in today, which just gives them so many more options. Um, and again, when you, th when, you, when you think about that slide that had all of the uh, different historical events, you could do a slide like that that was based on the music we listened to, right? My, um, my birth name was Michelle, I go by Shelby, but my parents named me after the John Williams version of the Beatles song, um, which disgusted me and horrified me as a young person, right? <laughs> because the Beatles were cool and John Williams was not. So, you know, I mean, for me, right? It's all relative. Um, so certainly I think taste in music definitely can identify, you can identify things generationally, but what I would say about emerging adults, at least in our culture, is that you couldn't say what their musical tastes are in the way that you might have been able to do for generations preceding. 
Yeah. Who's next? Yes. Yes, sir. Is this thing work? Yes, it is working. My name is Roger Gerber, and uh, I see a great expansion coming for your line of work <laughs> because it seems to me that the uh, older generations were more or less homogenous, and the country seems to be becoming more and more diversified. Uh, is there a tendency to look not just at characteristics, but at individuals, and particularly at what uh, Matthew Arnold called aliens or intellectuals? Uh, I'm interested in that because I am one, mm -hmm. uh, and I suspect that a great many people here would fit that description as well. Uh, so can you tell me what you mean by that a little bit, the second part, the alien slash intellectual? What, how, what are you talking about just how you engage with ideas in the world? It uh, it's, is a focus on ideas. A focus on ideas, yeah. In the, in the world. Okay. Uh, do you treat uh, these aliens any differently? Have you the mechanisms yet to treat individual cases, or do you still group according to uh, some uh, criteria that is apt to be changed in the next five years for, by some new social scientist? Right, right. So, I mean, I think your question gets the idea of how is my field emerging as um, there's far more diversity uh, within any cohort, not just differences between generations, but diversity within a cohort, in particular when we're talking about the college population. And it is changing a lot. Um, you know, you take a student who goes to a place like Willamette University and they have an 11 to 1 student faculty ratio and they have a whole host 160 faculty at the undergraduate level, um, a whole host of staff who support them in their student life and identity development, and then you take my office for 30,000, 35,000 living alumni, and we have three professionals serving that community, or five professionals, um, or maybe six, right, at a place of our size. And so we are forced by the constraints of resources to make choices about how we serve our constituents um, based on those resources. And as a result, we tend to simplify things. Um, and for a long, long time, we simplified them literally by saying, when did you graduate and where do you live? And that's how we're going to do our programming. We're going to have programs in Seattle and Portland and the Bay Area. And we're going to have programs for reunion years. And that's it. And you know, over the past 20 years since I've been in the field, Alumni programs certainly are doing a better job of understanding that we need to serve alumni through the way that they interact with us intellectually on campus. So whether it's the sciences or the arts or the social sciences, we have to think about interacting them around identity cohorts. We have to think about interacting with them um, through the lens of stage of life or generational or demographic differences like this. But we are nowhere near resourced enough to do that spectacularly well. We do use things that help us that weren't available to us 20 years ago. We have databases now. You know, our alumni file at Bucknell, when I started in 1997, it had only been two years out of a card file. Like my mother was a librarian, like the card catalog. We had a card catalog for alumni and we had five by seven cards and we had everything we knew about you on that file card and we transitioned into a database which then allowed us to start asking questions like who lives where, what did they study? Well, in 20 years that's gotten much more sophisticated and if we're good at paying attention, we know who your roommate was or who your freshman hallmates were or what extracurriculars you did or that you wrote editors in the newspaper and we can, if we're good and we have enough staff, we at least have the data to help us customize your experience with us. So maybe we send you news about these things and other people get news about these things. You know, we're used to going to Amazon and buying something and it comes up and says, people who bought this also like that, right? I would love 
<laughs> people who gave to this <laughs> also gave to this. <laughs> or people who attended this alumni program also attend. I would love to be that sophisticated. But we just don't have this. Well, sometimes it is usually wrong. Sometimes it's freakishly accurate. Um, and people who engage more online, like my life is very, very much online, um, <laughs> we are more likely to get more accurate predictions, right? Of, because I buy everything online. I, everything I do is online um, in that regard. So, so yes, it is changing what we do. Um, but it is resource intensive. And so um, it's changing what we do slowly. But it is definitely changing. Yeah. Um, OK, why don't I take one or two more? Yes, sir? Uh, Shelby, first of all, I really enjoy your presentation. It's relevant insights. Now, life is all about coping. And I want to take this up in terms of the younger generation, adolescence to adulthood, school to job, they're learning coping skills. The older generation is retiring from the workforce, being full-time parents or grandparents, going into leisure time, things like we're doing today. Is there any research or correlation that shows that coping skills learned as adolescents are resurrect and repeat, and what can we do to connect the two generations of learning from our adolescent years? And, and become more productive as retirees? You know, I don't, I don't know the answer to the question about whether or not there's, uh, I, I don't know the research, I don't know the body of research, but I can say, um, first of all, it's a great question. These are two major life transitions, right? Transition between adolescence into adulthood and transition between what I'll call the responsible years, right? Career, parent, spouse, uh, family to, um, and in aging parents to the years where you have more freedom in retirement. Um, I'm seeing interesting things in the higher education media about uh, countries in Europe that are cohabitating graduate students in, in retirement facilities where um, grad students need housing and people in retirement facilities like to interact with younger people and it's working out really well. So there's some interesting things about why is that working and is it working because those two groups of people are actually going through a similar experience of transition. Um, so it's a, it's a fascinating inquiry. I'd be, I'd be really curious to know. I mean, I, I'm not kidding when I say I think these are the two most ex exciting phases of life um, because there's more intellectual and social and personal freedom in, um, in the sort of years in emerging adolescence and retirement than at any other stage. So it would not surprise me that they have things going on that are in common. Yeah. OK. Um, any other burning questions before I? Lester, here. Yes, Lester. Uh, this, shifting back to the alumni and relationship with the institution, Yes. the thing that I think is the biggest challenge for the future is that's going to possibly disappear with the uh, online educational movement, which is inevitable. These people have learned to communicate with devices and live their lives. They have friends who are not friends or even acquaintances. So I think that in terms of your job, the question may be, will there be a relationship between people at the college and the college? Yeah. No, it's a really interesting question. How does the change in the way education is delivered change the work that I do? Well, certainly, but because I've stayed at small private residential colleges, I continue to enjoy a built-in constituency of people who typically spent four years in the same place together. So that makes my job a little easier. But um, I think it's important that we pay attention, but we also not make judgments about something being better or worse, but simply understanding that it's different. So um, there's a, a large online institution whose name is, is it Phoenix? Um, and they had a very interesting ad campaign for a while where they were showing lots of people wearing, um, they were showing the sort of legs and feet of lots of different people in lots of different situations wearing red socks. Um, red is one of the school colors, which is kind of an odd thing for an online school to have, but it has colors. And basically they were saying, you know, when you're from Phoenix, you belong to this family. And if you are a Phoenix graduate and you go interview with a Phoenix graduate, you have this thing in common. And they, so they were clearly trying, and I don't know if it worked or not, but trying to build a sense that you are still part of a community. Um, and, and so it's, somebody's paying attention to this, right? I also have many friends who are academics who are adjuncts and visiting, and so they supplement their income with online education. And 
Um, some of them argue that the certain platforms actually enable a lot of relationship building. And more and more programs are doing hybrid educational experiences where a graduate cohort, a graduate student cohort will do most of their courses online, but they are in a place together twice a year for three weeks at a time in a very intensive experience where those bonds can actually be stronger, some have argued to me, than bonds they might form with classmates in a more traditional setting. So I'm not, I'm not saying one way or the other. I think you're right, we have to pay attention. Um, and you know, how, how college gets funded and supported is, is changing already. So um, I tried to keep my life easy by staying in, in an environment that is changing the least. <laughs> But, um, but I, do, I do pay attention, I do, yeah. So um, another question that someone brought to me over the break that I thought was just, or maybe just a comment, was um, what the role of military service has played in these developmental stages. And Arnett doesn't really talk about it a lot, although people that he interviews certainly um, participate in the military, but this research was all done after conscription stopped happening, right? So, None of the young people that he researched for his theory were people who experienced a draft. Um, so, so that's just a, a point worth noting. Um, one might say that entrance into the military would accelerate your transition to adulthood quite quickly, right? Um, I would certainly think so. I am not a person who's ever been in the military and my, my, no one in my, fa in my immediate family did. But then there was the GI Bill. And the GI Bill brought a lot of vets to college campuses and created really the first generation of quote unquote non-traditional students. Vets who came to colleges like Willamette and Bucknell with their wives and husbands, who's, who were 23, 24, 25. That was the first movement really towards undergraduate students who were not only in that 18 to 22 year old age range. And they got to extend their adolescence because they got to, I mean, certainly they grew up a lot, I would imagine, based on their service, but then they got to go back to college and be a little bit less um, of a, maybe an adult. Now, some of them probably came with children and, and other responsibilities like that, but it's just, it's just an interesting question. Um, another person asked, why is it possible I needed to go out and get a job? Right, so how is this happening? And Arnett does suggest that one of the things that's greatly influenced, and this is not just in the United States, but in other industrialized countries, the increased disposable income of the baby boomer generation that has enabled their young people to make these choices. They have a safety net in their parents that maybe my parents or your parents would not have been able to provide. Whether they would have or not is another question altogether, but they might not have been able to. Um, so I just wanted to note that. And before I get started on my formal remarks, because I have the mic, I just want to say um, happy anniversary to Roger and Jeanette. Where are you? Where are they? Oh, there they are. So, you know, I get to take advantage of the fact that culturally we have these milestones that people celebrate, the 25th anniversary. We do this with reunions. 50 is a big deal. So um, congratulations, I, I, that's just really remarkable. I think it's tremendous, so happy anniversary. Um, okay, I have to see if I can make this go again. Okay. Oh, it's down here, I think, this one. Oh, there we go, okay, so. Um, so rather than just simply asking who our alumni are, which is what demographers and generational studies talk about, because of Arnett's theory, we are now starting to ask who are our alumni becoming? Acknowledging that for the years they are on campus and at least seven to 10 years afterwards, their becoming is still a very active thing indeed. And so this, is, this question is really starting uh, for people who do my, my work to inform how we're thinking about the work and how we're imagining it might change in the future. I would say that there's probably 10% of professionals in alumni engagement today who are actively thinking like this. 
most of us are hired and are just doing our jobs and trying to keep our programs going. And I had the luxury of working and going to grad school at the same time. Um, and while part of me would have loved to have been a full-time grad student, being able to study these things while I was working created an interplay between the practice and the theory that has dramatically changed the way I work and the way I think about my work. And most people who get higher education administration degrees go right back into practice. We don't continue to do research. We go right back to the jobs that we came from. And so there's not, the, the, the work, the research doesn't evolve as quickly as it would um, perhaps in other disciplines. So this is a very new conversation. But as you can imagine, if we're thinking about who are they becoming, these old models of generational and reunion-oriented engagement really fall short. And I'm not saying they should go away. They shouldn't because we have generations for whom these models do work, but they should not be all that we do. Um, we, you, ha you may have noticed in your own um, alma mater's materials, there is a lot of effort still in alumni programming to pluck the heartstrings and um, inspire nostalgia, it, because it still works to some degree, but if that's all we do, we will continue to miss the mark. So we have to think differently about this. And um, the, up the updates that we've done that I referred to earlier in our program have moved us in the right direction, but in my opinion, nowhere near far enough. While it is true that, it's, that we now know relationships are important, um, and one of the things that we do now that never used to happen is we actually track who people know and who people are friends with. So that if we want people to come to an event, we know that 10 people in that class who knew everyone. And we can call those 10 people, and if we can get them, we can get everybody else, right? So we can be much more sophisticated and efficient in our work if we pay attention to relationships. But in my work, as I talk to professionals around the country, I'm really proposing a new way of thinking about the work. And that is to define the student development life cycle for all of emerging adulthood. So I'm asking the question to my higher education colleagues, what would it mean if we said that part of going to Willamette is getting challenge and support through this entire phase? And that while you're on campus, that challenge and support is largely delivered by student life professionals. And when you're off campus, that challenge and support is largely delivered by alumni relations professionals. But mobilizing our alumni volunteers to, to partner with us in helping our students and our young alums would dramatically expand the resources that we would have to do this. So that's just a question I'm asking. Is that a good idea? Should we do that? Um, that we develop alumni and student services in sync to support and maximize development. So we think together about what happens in the first year and the second year and the third year experience and how we follow that pipeline through into the years after graduation. And that we build programs around the needs that we see in our emerging adults rather than the histories, what we have always done. And this is one of the hardest things because nostalgia, which we use to our advantage, creates an expectation that we will continue to do things in a certain way. And, um, and so there's an, there's an incentive to do the things we've always done. But if those things aren't actually meeting the needs of our students and our alumni, what do we do? So, sorry, I went the wrong direction. Okay, so when I look at our next work, there's some big themes that emerge. And one of them is this idea, of course, as we've talked about the fact that they're trying to answer the question, who am I? And they're trying on various life options. So the challenge of this for us is that facilitating healthy identity development has long been the specialty of student affairs professionals. But people in my world, advancement staff, have not traditionally needed to understand cognitive or psychosocial development theories, racial gender orientation, or other identity development theories, and more. For a long, long time, we were the party planners. We can put on a really good event. We can make sure everyone has name tags. We can make sure that the food is great. But to successfully understand this audience and develop appropriate programming, 
We will need to immerse ourselves in theory and practice of student affairs and to partner with our student affairs colleagues to develop a through line between campus programming during college and programming after. So that's a challenge for us. The opportunity is that a strong understanding of prevailing identity development theories and practices can dramatically improve the effectiveness of our programming, or at least that's my hypothesis. It can provide a set of principles that facilitate decisions about modifying, growing, or even eliminating programming. It can catalyze the development of new or more effective uses of institutional resources. Embracing the notion that alumni relations program is, not, is part of the team that supports identity development in students and that the student affairs program is part of the team that supports the identity, identity development of alumni changes about everything, changes everything about what we do if you let it. Centers like women's resource centers, LGBTQ centers, multicultural fail affairs, or as it's called here, equity and empowerment, have traditionally focused on enrolling students. So what if the programming, staffing, and resourcing was designed to support students and younger alumni? What if volunteers who were farther along in their development, regardless of whether they were students or alumni, and services were extended to all who needed them? What if programming was a hybrid of on-campus and off-campus designed to connect and build community regardless of student status? So I don't have the answers to all these questions, but this is the kind of stuff we think about, right? This can really sort of blow up the entire model for what we do. Alumni News, another example, has traditionally focused on stories about career success, emphasizing that success comes when one has figured it all out, right? You have the picture of the successful alumna who started her company, and now it's a, million, a multi-million dollar company on the magazine. What if instead, alumni communications also features stories about the messy but wonderful process of figuring it all out? What if they featured, rather than avoided, the complex path of identity development during and after college? Alumni mentoring programs have traditionally focused on educational and career mentorship. What if instead alumni mentors could help students with the process of coming out, or working in an industry where they are a minority, or determining whether or not to take time off to have a child? What if alumni identity mentors provided support, guidance, and connection during and after college? So this is the way this theory is starting to make me and others think about our work. We know that they experience significant instability. They experience it in love. And probably no one would formally argue that the, relation, the responsibility of college is matchmaking. Uh, we can capitalize on this element of the emerging adulthood experience if we program accordingly. We could program just like other organizations do. Sierra Club has backpacking trips for singles. Why can't we? So just an interesting question. College careers for work, college career centers have long struggled to engage students in thinking about life after college before their last semester on campus, right? Everybody runs to the career center in the spring of their senior year. Um, our NETS works helps us to understand, however, that the career conversation will likely extend well beyond that final spring semester. Of the students who go to graduate school, only 50% of them go right after graduation. So why should we not provide graduate advising for our young alumni? Of students who go directly to work, they will likely change jobs two, three, or more times in the decade after they graduate. Not in their life, in the decade. So why shouldn't we be providing career placement and replacement and replacement services for our young alumni? The need for continued guidance, mentoring, and support around career discernment and placement is dramatically higher than our current programming level support. How can we mobilize staff and volunteers to help our alumni reach a point of relatively solid career identity and success that comes in adulthood rather than emerging adulthood? And as far as location is concerned, one of the most important things for us is that we can find people. We can't tell you where an event is, or goodness sakes, we can't ask you for money if we uh, don't know where you are. There's this great New Yorker cartoon. I think it was from the, it must have been the, the early 2000s. Um, two people stranded on an island, clearly, um, you know, rough for wear. One is, appears to be pacing. 
Um, and the other is sitting calmly enjoying the sunshine. And the one who's pacing says, you know, what are we going to do? We have to escape. And the one who's calm says, oh, that's OK. I just pledged a million dollars to my alma mater. I know they're going to find me. <laughs> So we do like to know where people are. <laughs> the challenge of this is, of course, we don't know where our emerging adults are. They change locations so many times, and they don't really care to keep us informed. Email helps a little, because their email now, unlike it did in the 20, in the 20 years ago when I started, their email now tends to stay constant um, what, uh, from, from early childhood. Um, but our, one, our habit of updating our alumni database once or twice a year, our address file, is not sufficient. Um, if we look to our net, we learn that the emerging adult's relationship to his or her parent, however, stays strong during this period. 20 years ago, we would have never imagined sending your alma mater news to your parents' house when you were 27. But now, we do. And the, they're either living there, or their parents will pass it along to them. So if we extend our relationship from the student and alumna to the relationship with the family, we can actually capitalize on that family relationship to keep the family engaged with the alma mater. So if we don't know where Jose lives right now, we will probably know where his parents are. Um, so we can ask for their help. So these are just some samples of how this theory and what we understand about emerging adulthood might inform or change the way we do our work. So philosophically speaking, what's, what, what I'm starting, and doing this presentation was really helpful. It forced me to put some things down in writing that I, that I hadn't, hadn't necessarily done. And I'm sure, I'm sure my thinking will continue to evolve. But we, philosophically, I think we have to understand that we are partners in the exploration process. Um, those of us who do this work in alumni relations and frankly in student affairs and and they would like our partnership unlike perhaps previous generations um, but that exploration lasts a lot longer and there's much blur blurrier lines emerging between student life and um, and alumni relations work their identities are fluid and not fixed and so just because we understand who you are today does not mean we should claim to understand who you will be next year or the year after that so we have to keep paying attention talking to you about your interests and your identity. Um, we should not use the answers that students fill out on their application about their ethnicity or their gender identification or any of those, or their religion, as the truth for the rest of their life, right? Um, we have to think about redefining our role. And parents, man. Parents, parents, parents. So students' relationships with their parents as a result of this, um, of my understanding of it as a result of this work is, is really different. These young people are connected to their parents in ways that I never would have thought possible and that I never would have desired. I, I adore my parents. I, they, were, they are lovely people. Um, my father's no longer living, but um, I called them occasionally while I was in college. Um, and, uh, but it was occasional. It was every two or three weeks. Um, I went home at Thanksgiving break and Christmas my first two years, and then gradually I didn't live home in the summer. You know, it was just, that was normal then. Um, that is not normal now. Um, students are in touch with their parents all throughout the day. Uh, students are relying on their parents to get them up in time for class. <laughs> students are helping, their parents are helping them pick courses at best, write papers at worst. Uh, sometimes I have friends on faculty, I haven't heard this from a faculty member here, but at Bucknell it was common for a student to bring their cell phone and call their parent and put it on speaker during a, an advising session. Um, and this continues well into this emerging adulthood, buying their first car, buying their first apartment, renting their first apartment. Um, my niece, who just graduated from Skidmore College in New York, just moved to Nashville. Her parents packed up stuff and drove it down to Nashville. Her father, my brother, fixed up her front yard to, so, to his standards, right? <laughs> Found a guy to mow it every few weeks. Um, it's a lovely little home. I'm certain, uh, my niece is an extraordinarily responsible young woman and she's working um, in, a, in a wonderful, she's teaching autistic children, so, um, you know, she's not, maybe making a ton of money, but she's doing a good thing for the world, but I'm sure my brother is subsidizing her life. 
so that she is living in a way that he can tolerate, right? Instead of the cockroach infested apartment that I had right out of college, right? <laughs> Which my mother also didn't tolerate, but it never would have occurred to her to send me money to, so that I could live in some different way, right? I mean, this is just so, so if we're gonna have relationship with these young people as students and young alums, we have to understand the role that their parents play. And if we're smart, we actually engage with the parents. So we have an event for parents. We call it Tacos and Tears, the last day of student orientation. So first of all, student orientation now lasts a week. It's like camp. But, and several days are for the parents. I don't know if you are all aware of this. But parents actually go through their own programming. A lot of that programming is stop calling your children, let your children make decisions, your children are adults. But it's also telling the, the parents what to expect about residence life and dining, et cetera, et cetera. We have an event that gets them off campus and plies them with alcohol so they will leave. Because otherwise, they won't leave. I am not kidding. Um, and you know, some of this is because we have more first generation students than ever before. 25% of Willamette's first year class is first generation. And you know, 20, 30 years ago, that would have not been true at a place like Willamette. So that's extraordinary. And leaving your child at college for a first generation parent is traumatic in a, in a way that I think it's not for someone who's gone through the experience themselves, right? So, so we want to respect that there's differences from all kinds of reasons, but most of it is because these parents are so involved. So we can capitalize on that. We create a relationship with the parents. Parents actually give us money. Some parents are more connected to us than their own alma mater. Um, some parents are so grateful for the transformation their child has gone through while at Willamette or Occidental or Bucknell um, that they choose to put Willamette as a priority for their philanthropic support, and that's extraordinary. So we would be foolish to not pay attention to this group. Um, at Bucknell, I'm sure it's much bigger now, but at Bucknell, when I worked there, parents of current students gave over a million dollars every year to support the institution in annual fund gifts, gifts for no designation. And then there were parents who served on the board who would make major gifts as well. It's really extraordinary. Parents who are paying tuition you know, are making gifts. Um, really remarkable. Um, so parents, parents, parents. We have to pay attention to parents. So philosophically, we have to be thinking about those things. And then practically, I, I referenced a lot of this, but we have to totally redefine how we stay in touch. Um, uh, this sort of updating your address every year or every two years doesn't work. We don't print alumni directories anymore. You know, all kinds of things are changing. We have to partner with student life. We have to expand our definition of affinity programming through the rest of emerging adulthood um, and to include identity, this really critical identity development about who I am. Um, we should really be thinking about advising, academic advising and career discernment together and as something that, as I said before, goes through all of emerging adulthood because academic advising revisits during graduate school conversations. Um, we should hire more people in advancement who have this student life background, who understand the theory to practice of adult and adolescent development. We have to find ways to do more personalization. Given the resources we have, we have to do the best we can. We have to constantly remember this theory of challenge and support, which is something student life people talk about all the time, but not something alumni affairs professionals think about a lot. Uh, alumni affairs professionals tend to think about butts and seats. How many people did you get to the event? Did everybody like the shrimp puffs? Did people have a good time? Um, did you get more people there than last year? As opposed to thinking about what did attending that event do for that person? in the process of becoming who they are. How did that event help them move along that developmental continuum? Whether it's in their own identity development or frankly in their connection to us, their engagement with us. And then again, parents, parents, parents. So you know, we have um, a parents council. Um, Bucknell, which has, just for perspective, Bucknell is about 110 professionals in, uh, in an office like mine, we have about 32, so it, the scale is much different, but they have five people in parent engagement in their advancement office. So five people just for engaging with parents. They have a parents of alumni reunion. This is people whose children went to Bucknell in the past. They themselves did not go, and they come back. 
it's remarkable and that, how wonderful. So, you know, it extends the definition of who is in your community by, by a great deal. Um, so, while we are asking questions about who they are becoming, we are simultaneously asking questions as professionals about who we are becoming. What is an alumni program? What should it be? How do we get to where we want to go? Um, and there's no really clear answers in the industry, but um, it sure is fun. So, um, so that is my official formal presentation, and I'm happy to take questions if you like, and thank you for, for humoring me. <laughs> Any questions? Well, so while we're waiting for someone to get a microphone, someone asked me at the break, what do I do exactly? So I will explain. Um, I'm the Vice President for Advancement, and that means I'm one of the staff who reports to the President, and so therefore I'm part of the Senior Administration. Um, my day-to-day -day responsibilities are, of course, running the Advancement Office, which includes alumni, parent, and community relations, which includes ICL. Um, and it also includes fans of Bearcat Athletics and um, uh, folks like that. And then um, also fundraising. So managing that unit. And I have a team of three direct reports who take care of that on a day-to-day -day basis. And then I am the chief fundraising officer. So there's about eight or nine of us in the team who spend time visiting with alums across the country and talking to them about um, what their goals and objectives are for their philanthropy and whether or not there's a match. And um, I'll tell you what I tell most people, because at cocktail parties, when people ask you what you do and you tell them you're a fundraiser, inevitably the reaction is, ew. <laughs> I could never do that. That's disgusting. And then I'm like, oh, it's nice to meet you, too. Um, but, and my partner, who's a college professor and a writer, everybody's like, oh, that's so interesting. And I'm like, hmm. <laughs> um, but what I tell them is that I get to be part of the most generous act of someone's life. Um, because they aren't giving to their children in that moment. They're not volunteering for an organization that helps their kids in school. They are giving to future people they don't know. And it's really extraordinary. And whether that gift is $500, $5,000, $5 million, or I hope before I retire, $50 million. That would be really awesome. <laughs> um, they're all extraordinary because it's all a choice that someone is making that is well beyond what anyone should ask or expect them to do. And it is a great gift. So that is why I do it, and that is what I do. So I'll answer, I answered that question, yes. Uh, I'm amazed that you, uh, with your job, and you spent a whole two hours talking about it, and you didn't mention football once. I did not. <laughs> I did not. Um, yeah, I was, I was reared on Penn State, as you can imagine, we are. And, um, and I, my father being in the blue band, I watched every Penn State game growing up. And I was also a Steelers fan, because he was from Pittsburgh. But I have to admit, it's very hard for me to watch football anymore. Um, because I know enough people who've suffered from brain injuries and things that it's, it breaks my heart, because I loved it so much. And I do miss it, but, um, but yeah. Oh, so that's an interesting question. Um, so my thesis, which I do not encourage you to read, um, but the question that I asked in my thesis is, what is a predictor of, of giving? Because after working at Bucknell for a, a number of years, I would constantly be in meetings where people, not in the advancement office, would say, oh, well, if we make that change, people will stop giving. Or we all know that people who did this are more likely to give. And I would say, I was in charge of the database. I was like, how do you know that? You didn't ask me. I didn't tell you that. So it only took me a few research methods courses to figure out that I could ask those questions of my own database. And at least for Bucknell, what I found was that participation in Greek life, in athletics, gender identity, um, not, no, not, a, not at all predictive of giving behavior. Not in the slightest. All the things that people say over and over again. And in fact, there have been more studies about athletics and its relationship to giving than any other question about relationships of one characteristic to giving. And none of them have found a, ca a causal or, or even, um, oh my god, thank you. Uh, <laughs> 
um, or correlated relationship. And so we make programmatic decisions based on these false assumptions. So my, you know, my sort of evangelical uh, message when I talk to folks in my field is ask the question with the data. Um, get the data first, don't make programmatic decisions based on that. And, um, and so yeah, I annoyed a lot of people at Bucknell when I, when I told them that, especially the fundraisers who were working in athletics. But anyway, yes. Uh, what do you think came first, the chicken or the egg? <laughs> the, the chicken being the helicopter parent that stays very intrusive and um, kind of enables the student to be dependent, yeah. or the egg, the student who wants to call parent every day and wants to stay dependent. I mean, it seems like it, controlling or intrusive parents are at least a factor in uh, encouraging the delayed onset of adulthood. Yeah, um, well, that, that's a question we could talk about for hours, but um, I'll just make a few comments. So first of all, I think the desire for freedom of choice came first in that the Cultural Revolution of the 60s was really about young people saying, I don't want to cut my hair like that and be a responsible adult right away. I want to explore the world, uh, people, friendships, relationships, sex, all those things, right? That pressure came from the young people who wanted that. And that was not a cultural norm at the time. That was not supported by older generations, and they did it anyway. So I think that egg or chicken, that was, the, was one of the first drivers of this. Um, and then the other thing I'll say is that what we perceive as intrusive and controlling is not necessarily how these people perceive it. Our younger emerging adults um, do, would not describe their relationships with their parents the way I might have in this talk, right? Um, it's, it's shocking and funny and interesting to us, but um, for them, that's a good thing. It gives them the freedom to do those things. So um, I I'm, I'm always try to challenge myself to, to remind, re remember, just because it's different doesn't mean it's bad. And, um, and so, you know, was it student, was it young people who grew up in the 60s who realized they didn't want to put those boundaries on their children, who were able to relate to their children in ways that gave their children freedom to both be different and stay connected, right? Because I didn't call my parents to tell them what I was doing because I didn't want them to know what I was doing, right? I remember vividly calling my dad to tell, my mom and dad, and they were on, you know, in the old days, landlines on two different phones. And I was calling them to tell them where I was gonna go so they could reach me in the case of an emergency because this was a habit in my family. And I was going to Dartmouth for the weekend. I went to Mount Holyoke. It was all women. We had a brother school, it was Dartmouth. We went there a lot on the weekends. Um, that's where the boys were. And my mother started asking me, where was I staying, blah, 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 blah. And my father said, Elaine, do you, know, do you want to know where she is or not? Right? <laughs> Wise move, dad. Well played, right? So I would, but, but this generation can tell their parents things because their parents are unbound by the norms that many of us grew up with. So. So they don't see that connection as control or constricting. They see it as supportive. Now, everything is on a continuum. So that theory of challenge and support, some of our students have exactly the right amount from these helicopter parents, and it is extraordinary because they take risks in a supportive environment and they become amazing people. Most students fall somewhere in the middle, and then there are some students for whom that helicopter behavior is so much support that their growth and development actually is dramatically diminished. Right, but this is a continuum, and I would say that most parents are actually safely in the middle these days. But it's still very different than what we're used to, with one phone on the hall, and you know, you saw your parents at Christmas break, and those kinds of things. Yeah, Shelby, we need to end. Uh, it's been a wonderfully stimulating morning. Uh, please give your mom and dad a call and say hello. <laughs> I will. What a great job you did today. Or give us give us their email address, and we'll do it for you. <laughs>